Hi there, my name is Max, and today I'm going to be talking about the DA42 NG-6 propeller system. Uh, this is a system that's tightly coupled with the engine, the gearbox, and the ECUs. We're really going to focus on the propeller today and a bit of the gearbox. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of background on fixed pitch versus variable pitch propellers. Um, this may come as a review to a lot of you, so feel free to skip, but I think it's useful contact. The DA42 has variable pitch propellers, and if you're coming from 172, you almost certainly flew fixed pitch propeller airplanes. The simplest way I think to explain this and kind of visualize it is if you've ever ridden a bike um, or driven a manual car, imagine only being stuck in third gear. That's what a fixed pitch propeller is like. So when you ride a bike and you're in third gear, you know, starting off, it's actually kind of difficult. You feel like you're pushing really hard, not going that fast. But then as you get up to like 10 miles per hour, it's actually like the perfect gear for that speed. And if you try to go past 10 miles per hour on the bike and you're still in third gear, you feel like you're pedaling a bunch, but you're not actually going much faster. That's a fixed pitch propeller. A variable pitch propeller is like a bike with multiple gears. So when you're down low and you're just starting uh, to get going, uh, you can drop down to first gear and it feels like you can start gaining momentum. Then you go up to second and third. And then when you want to go up to 20 miles per hour, you can go up to fourth and fifth gear. And it feels like when you pedal, you're actually giving the distance for the amount of effort you're putting in. Think about the finer pitch as a lower gear, something you'd want when you're you know, taking off and building up speed, and a more coarse pitch as something you want when you're going faster, you want to take a bigger chunk of the air, that's a higher gear, something you'd use at cruise. Now just briefly, we mentioned we have feathering propellers, and what this means is that in the event of an engine failure, we want the propellers to be in the most aerodynamic position um, that reduce drag, and that's a pitch angle that's parallel to the oncoming airflow. Now, in a conventional variable pitch propeller airplane, you've seen those blue levers that allow the pilot to control the RPM. In the DA42, we have FADEC and the ECUs make all the decisions for us. And the propeller governor or the propeller regulating system will actually take care of setting the pitch angle of the blade so that we hit that RPM at that power setting. In other words, it's like an automatic transmission car. We don't need to worry about what gear we're in. We set the power lever setting as a percentage and the ECUs figure out the rest, similar to setting a certain depth of the gas pedal towards the ground. So Diamond actually publishes a propeller set point curve, which we can see here. And if we look at the EIS on the left side, we see we set a 60% load setting and we're hitting 1980 on the RPM. And that matches up with the propeller set point curve. So we have empty propeller propellers. They're three bladed, they're wood composite construction with reinforced plastic coating. The leading edges are stainless steel and we actually have a rubber strip, if you have de-ice, that guides the de-ice fluid out to the leading edges of the prop. And the other thing we have is a aluminum spinner. Now, if we want to move the plane, we can actually push the prop. We should not push the spinner. Now, there may be a difference of opinion on pre-flight. I personally like to move my hand along the leading edge of the prop. Some people say don't do that. You could cut your hand. My view is I'd rather cut my hand and know something's there than not know. This is an example of damage to the leading edge of an MT propeller. You can actually see a chip in that coating as well. The AFM cautions against high RPM on the ground because you could suck up a stone or something and damage those leading edges. Now we'll talk more about it in the engine video, but this is a conventional twin because we have the same engine mounted the same way on both sides. And this means the propellers rotate the same way, which is clockwise from the pilot's perspective. It also means the left engine is the critical engine. The critical engine is the engine that most adversely affects aircraft performance when it becomes inoperative. And this is determined by four factors using the acronym PAST, which is P factor, accelerated slipstream, spiraling, spiraling slipstream, and torque. We're not going to cover these all here, but there's something you should learn as part of your multi-training. I want to pause quickly and just check in. We started off talking about the difference between fixed pitch propellers versus variable pitch like we have, and then we talked about how we have a FADEX system and the power set by the pilot translates to an RPM on a propeller set point curve and how the prop governor is in charge of actually making sure we hit that RPM. Then we transition to talking about the MT propeller, how it's constructed and what it looks like and how you should pre-flight it. Now we're going to go under the cowling and talk about how the system actually works. So let's talk about how the system actually works. Uh, you can kind of think of the ECUs as the brain of the system. They're the ones who know the power setting and know the associated RPM we need to hit and they inform the prop governor. We have an MT propeller governor valve um, as to what RPM we need to hit. And the governor is kind of like the muscle. It says, great, based on this RPM number, I'm going to adjust the pitch angle of the blades to ensure we hit that. 
The propeller governor is able to affect change on the pitch angle of the propeller blades by pumping oil into the propeller hub. More oil and higher pressure leads to a finer pitch than we use for takeoff. And removing pressure from the propeller hub or decreasing pressure leads to a more coarse pitch and ultimately if we decrease it completely to a feathered pitch. So we primarily change the pitch angle of the blades with hydraulic or gearbox oil pressure. But there's two other mechanisms for changing the pitch angle that we need to be aware of. The first one is counterweights. And this is because if we were to just spin these propellers around and around and around, well, the centrifugal force is naturally gonna to wanna to force the propeller into a low pitch angle. Think about it, it's aerodynamic most when you have a low pitch angle or a flat angle to going around in the wind. But that's most adverse to flight for us. That's the opposite of feathered. So we have counterweights on each of the bases of the blades to counteract and force the blades into a more coarse or feathered pitch naturally. You'll notice that when we shut down, the propellers don't fully feather, and that's because of the low pitch stop pins, which prevent the propeller from feathering under 1300 RPM. Now, trust me, there's a lot to discuss when talking about the gearbox. The things we need to know with respect to the propeller are really two things. One is the gearbox is responsible for derating the engine speed to the propeller by a ratio of 1.69. The other thing is that the prop governor uses the gearbox oil to change the pitch angle of the blades. So when we're doing that check in the pre-flight to see if we see the gearbox oil is full through the sight glass, that's especially important. The other thing to note is that the RPM we see in our EIS, that's actually the propeller RPM, not the engine RPM. The pressure accumulator is also known as the unfeathering accumulator, and it stores a small quantity of pressurized gearbox oil in a nitrogen charged metal cylinder. And when we turn the engine master on, this causes the accumulator to release the gearbox oil to push the propeller out of the feathered position. On the flip side, if we want to feather, we want to pull the power lever all the way back to idle before turning the engine master switch into the off position. This will open the electric governor valve and all of the oil will flow back from the propeller hub, allowing the blades to move into that feathered position. At the same time, the electric valve at the pressure accumulator closes and all the oil pressure is restored in the accumulator. Like my other system videos, I wanna close out talking about emergency procedures that involve this system. And with the propeller, there's really one, defective propeller RPM regulating system, which is a fancy way of saying the RPM isn't doing what we expect it to do. This problem set is broken out into three subsections, and the first one is oscillating RPM. If the RPM is oscillating, we wanna check the power and change it. Potentially at a different power setting, the RPM may be steady. If that doesn't work, we wanna check and see if there's an ECU failure for that side, either A or B. And if there is, then we want to switch the ECU to the other ECU. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we want to go back to auto and land at the nearest airfield. The next subsection is propeller overspeed. And we know from our power plant limitations that the maximum overspeed is 2,500 RPM for a maximum of 20 seconds. So if we find ourselves in this situation, we want to go to section B of the checklist. And the first item will be to reduce the power Hopefully reducing the power, the RPM will also decrease along the power curve. But if it doesn't, we wanna go check and see if there's a left and right ECU failure. And if it's a failure on either A, switch it to B. And if it's a failure on B, switch it to A. If that doesn't resolve itself, again, we wanna land at the nearest suitable airfield. Finally, the last subsection of this problem is a fixed RPM, meaning that we adjust the power setting, but the RPM remains the same. In this situation, we follow almost exactly the same checklist, and if we can't resolve the issue by switching the ECU, we want to get to the nearest suitable airfield and terminate the flight. It's very likely I cover this again in the engine video, but for the sake of someone seeing just this video, I wanna talk about engine failures and how the prop plays a role. Uh, long story short, if we're under 3,000 feet or this is a critical phase of flight, we don't have time to troubleshoot. We wanna secure the engine. So we wanna get it to feathered, get it to the most aerodynamic position, declare an emergency, and come back and land. So you should know these memory items. We are gonna go power lever max, maintain directional control, airspeed to VYSE, gear up, get rid of that drag, then flaps up, and then secure the engine. Now, I like to use the identify, verify, fix, secure pattern. So we identify dead foot, dead engine, verify by pulling the throttle back on that engine, fix by turning the engine master off, which should feather the propeller, and then secure, we go to alternator for the affected engine, turn that off, the fuel pump, check that that's off, and then finally, the fuel selector for that affected engine, we wanna pull back to the off position past the red safety guard. Now, let's say you're above 3,000 feet, uh, you've had an engine failure, you've stabilized the situation, 
and you want to attempt to restart the engine. Well, we have two situations that we need to prepare for in terms of engine restarts. The first one is restarting the engine with the starter, and the second one is restarting the engine by windmilling. There's really two conditions for restarting with the starter. The first is altitude. If it's an immediate restart, we can be up to 18,000 feet, but if it's going to be in the range of two minutes, we need to be under 10,000 feet. The second condition is the airspeed. We really want to be under 100 knots indicated airspeed, preferably lower, um, so that we don't put so much stress on the starter. Assuming those two conditions are met, we can attempt to restart the engine. We're going to make sure the power lever is to idle. The fuel selector should be out of the off position and into the on position. Alternate air as required. Alternator will come on. Engine master will come on. This should unfeather the propeller. And then finally, we'll turn the starter on for the affected engine. This should start and we will check the circuit breakers to make sure everything is correct and reset anything if necessary. Now with a windmilling start, we also have the same altitude restrictions. The biggest difference with a windmilling start is our minimum and maximum restart airspeeds. Our minimum restart airspeed is 125 indicated and our maximum restart airspeed is 145 indicated. Now, assuming those two conditions are met, we will check that our power levers are at idle. We will check the fuel selectors. They should be on if they were in the off position before. The alternate air will set as required. The alternators will turn on and then the engine master switch finally will turn on. The propeller should unfeather and restart by windmilling. Fantastic, so that is the DA42 NG-6 propeller system, or at least a, a cursory overview. I highly recommend checking out the Emory Riddle uh, propeller diagrams, animations. They do an incredible job of visualizing a lot of what we talked about today. Um, if I've learned anything new, I will leave it in the video description or in the comments. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those below. Otherwise, I will see you guys in the next one.